be really interested to have your perspective on what you thought the priorities were for the kind of future agenda for right. environmental research. In particular around the issue of mobility. Uh, but yes, especially, mm. especially mo mobility, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, again, uh, it's, it's interesting to reflect upon it because um, mobility uh, comes into my own work but only almost as an aside. You know, it's an aspect of a person's uh, biological profile or health and well-being, uh, how mobile they are, um, rather than being the uh, basis of it. I mean, at the moment, um, it, your question has made me reflect. Certainly, uh, you mentioned earlier the social interaction in uh, public places yeah. research that was a study for the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, who did a whole program of work on public places at, at that time, where we involved uh, older people, and uh, not just older people, people of a wide range of age groups, to do more participatory research observing uh, the town of Aylesbury. Um, Partly that was to enable us to look at those interactions uh, of people in the centre of town but also in some re wider residential areas um, across a whole year. So there were seasonal issues yeah. there's, and there were di diurnal issues because we wanted to be able to observe the town from seven in the morning uh, till quite late into the evening. And to do that, we as a research team just weren't big enough. So we sought um, members of the community who were interested in observing their, themselves and their <laughs> town. Um, and we located nine sites across the town uh, where we invited people to work in pairs and we trained people at the Open University in doing observational work and recording not only in narrative terms what they saw, but then also on small maps the situation of, of the people that they saw yeah. and to give an estimate of the age of the people that they saw. So um, you can imagine, uh, well, we didn't know how it was going to go, but we ended up with uh, over 40 uh, volunteers. Uh, well, I say volunteers. No, they weren't volunteers. They were paid. We managed to negotiate with Joseph Rowntree um, an amount that we could pay observers for doing this with us as co-researchers, I think they wanted to be called in the end. Um, and they obviously had the academic team's support at all times, and we probably couldn't have done it without the mobile phone, I suspect, <laughs> but uh, in the way that we did. Um, and we had, s people could stay with us for a shorter period of time or a longer period of time. And I think we'd certainly had a small number of people who did at least six weeks six months, it's not six weeks, six months of observation with us. Wow. Whereas other people were um, students who did it with us in their holiday times. Uh, we had people who came with a friend and they only thought they would want to do it with those friends but uh, as pairs, but once the group got used to each other a bit more, we were able to pair people up in different ways and they got quite cohesive in terms of um, being the co-researchers on this group. And that worked very well, but you can imagine we ended up with an enormous quantity of data, which we still have, and probably it's true to, fair to say that um, we've, we've analyzed that data to a certain level. Right. It could be a wonderful data source for somebody else to do further work mm -hmm. with. Um, and we were a, a team, a mixed team of social scientists um, coming to that. Um, and I think uh, the reason I raise it in relation to issues of mobility um, is that we certainly saw 
a obviously we're observing the people we could observe. We weren't observing the people who, obviously, this is a silly thing to say, we weren't observing the people who weren't there. <laughs> but, but there were patterns. Yeah. So uh, older people would definitely come into town or move from a certain place at a certain time of the day. Now, you can relate to that to things like bus passes and timing and avoiding children going to school or, or avoiding people going to work or coming home from work. Um, so uh, there are routines and patterns yeah. across, this, yeah. across cities and towns that do emerge in that way. But only with observations do you get an opportunity to see the um, spaces of a town that are contested by different groups or avoided by different groups um, or where people obviously feel more comfortable to be present. And then it relates to things like street furniture, to the distance people have to get to the toilet and uh, the way in which regeneration of central squares can lead to them taking out facilities that used to be there and not replacing them, which leads to issues around um, consultation and participation yeah. of the local population in those kinds of planning issues. Mm. And some of that relates to um, later work that we've been involved in in relation to age-friendly cities or age-friendly communities and people's need for certain um, sitting spots and uh, resting points and and again we know uh, the work of uh, well she was a former colleague of yours but Lizzie Burton's and Lynn Mitchell's uh, work now um, uh, Lynn at, at Warwick um, so there is other, uh, from the I'd Go literature, mm. there are other data sets around mobility that need to come together with, say, the work that you're doing around cycling. Um, there's also the issue of people with a particular health condition relating to mobility. So I'm thinking around uh, obesity, uh, type 2 diabetes, uh, and mobility. Yeah. Uh, that could be a special, a special area of interest for somebody in relation to looking at mobility. Um, that may also be true in relation to visual impairment and mobility. Uh, and some of these these almost special themes can relate to the work that you're doing on cycling. Now, again, you'd have to tell me, but um, there are also the people who haven't been on a bicycle for a, such a long time. They would never see themselves as cyclists. Mm. And in later life, how would you necessarily get them on a bicycle? Uh, you know, I've been pondering that in knowing I was going to talk to you um, because uh, it may be an issue, sorry, uh, um, uh, about their balance being uh, seen as problematic. Or, um, so there are, there are sort of hurdles to get over before actually being able to benefit from the activity. Yeah. Uh, so, and some of that, I expect, will... It's almost like the next study. It, well, perhaps it isn't. You'll tell me in a minute that you're doing that kind of work as well. Well, we're, me. We're, we, we're, we are investigating that. I think that there has been um, a criticism of cycling research in the past that it's tended to talk to cyclists about cycling, and we're trying to get away from that and talk to non-cyclists or people who haven't cycled for a good considerable time to find out from a kind of life, life course perspective, what are the factors around that, that are preventing them or not encouraging them to cycle. Um, and that could be some of the things that you mentioned in terms of the, um, physical ability or um, you know, balance and so on, um, or it might relate, relate to the environment or the perception of the mm -hmm. f physical environment, the mm -hmm. materiality, as you mm -hmm. say, of, of place um, and what it m might be like to to cycle. So I think you're right. I think it could well be that we'll start to 
um, explore some interesting avenues that might have further potential. Thanks very much, Sheila. That was absolutely great. I uh, really enjoyed it. It's um, fascinating to hear more in de detail about your research and relate it to the uh, Cycle Boom project. So thank you very much. Yes, well, I've really enjoyed it. It's, uh, it's great to be able to talk to somebody who's uh, interested in a similar field of work. <laughs> yeah, great, fantastic. Uh, well, I hope you've uh, found that useful as well. And um, I'll say goodbye now.